Video games are a winner-take-all market, where top earners get astronomically higher revenue than everyone else. For games sold on Steam alone, the top 1% earn about a gazillion dollars. The top 5% is a squillion, then the numbers continue to drop off sharply before flattening out a bit. Or, for the more visually inclined, here's a graph. Even if we remove those pesky outliers in the top 5%, it's still massively skewed. Because of this, I'm going to be using a log scale on the y-axis. What this means is each increment in the y-axis is a multiple of the previous instead of just an addition. Basically, being slightly higher on a log scale means dramatically higher values. So, if games are a winner-take-all market, that begs the question, what does it take to be a winner? Do the best games just naturally find their way to the top? Or is that just an overly idealistic notion and there's some hidden treasure trove of indie games out there that are just as good as Portal or Zelda and nobody knows about them? Of course, things like marketing and luck are factors, but I want to go a bit deeper. I'm going to try to find examples of truly great games that have been overlooked. First, we've got a couple of questions to answer. How do we know how much money games are making? And how are we measuring how good a game is? Estimating revenue of a game relies on the fact that the number of reviews is public. A certain percentage of the people who buy a game will leave a review. So if we know the number of reviews, we can work backwards and estimate the number of units sold. We then reduce the revenue to account for factors like Steam's cut or regional pricing and such. It's not perfect, but it'll get us in the right ballpark. This is why I'll be focusing on Steam games, because the review count is publicly visible. Okay, now for the hard part. How do we define a great game? I want some measurable quantity so I can automate the initial filter. There are various measures you could potentially use. They're all biased or skewed in their own special ways, and many suffer from low sample size, which is a real problem if we're looking for fairly unknown games. I'm going to use a modified version of Steam reviews. On Steam, players can leave either positive or negative reviews. There are no star ratings or scores out of 10. This allows us to compute a metric called positivity, which is simply the percentage of the reviews which are positive. There is one issue with this I'd like to account for though. My intent is to have a metric for how good the game is just by itself in a vacuum. But Steam reviews are often, how good is this game relative to player expectations? For example, you're much more likely to leave a negative review if you spent $20 on a game that you didn't like than if you'd only spent $2 on that game. Price isn't the only external factor that can influence reviews, but it's a pretty good one and it's easy to incorporate. All I did was scale the negative reviews based on the price essentially magnifying the effect of negative reviews on cheap games. This still isn't perfect though, so my plan is to just use these automated methods to find a short list of potentially great games which appear to be underperforming. After that, I'm going to manually go through what's left and see what I find. Okay, I've gathered up my data. How does this look? Well, here you go. Now, first I need to clarify what's even included in this data. I can't feasibly estimate the revenues of free games which rely on in-game purchases, and really cheap games are also a bit problematic, so I'm excluding anything under $4. I'm also filtering out games with fewer than 50 total reviews or fewer than five negative reviews. I really didn't want to have to filter out these so aggressively, since the whole point is finding lesser known games. But I found without this, there were just so many high rated games which were clearly not all that great. And I'm assuming it was all the developers, friends and family piling on with positive reviews. I'm also limiting to games released in 2010 or later where digital distribution started taking over. Back to the graph. I'm still using the log scale on the Y axis. The X axis is the game's percentile of its modified positivity, which is a bit of a mouthful, but this is the result of taking each game's Steam review positivity and doing that price scaling I mentioned, and then ranking it against everything else. So theoretically, the worst game will be on the far left and the best on the far right, with everything evenly spaced in between. 
Now you might be wondering what's going on with that bottom right section of the graph. Also, you may have noticed that the y axis doesn't start at zero. These are just the result of the filtering and scaling of the review scores that's been applied. As an aspiring game developer myself, when I first saw this, I was pretty dismayed. There is a vague correlation going on between rating and revenue, but so many high rated games are far below the revenue you'd expect from a great game. Like, in theory, these are in the top 5% of games in Steam, but they're earning like 40k. Making a great game is incredibly difficult, but imagine you actually pulled it off. You created a genuinely amazing game, but then you don't even get the payoff that's meant to come from working in a high risk market. And remember, this is a log scale, so they are orders of magnitude below the high revenue games. Desperate for answers, I started looking through the games in this bottom right portion of the graph. Do you want to know what I found? Anime. So much anime. We got anime dating sims. We got mildly pornographic visual novels, JRPGs, anime bullet hells. 50% of the games in this bottom right portion of the graph were some kind of anime thing. Now, I could do some analysis for what separates the high performing anime dating sims from the rest, but I don't really care. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove them from the data. Solved. This next category of underperforming games, I'm not quite sure what the label is. There's this niche of highly realistic World War II strategy games, high fidelity train driving sims, U-boat simulators, things like that. I'm just gonna call this category games my dad would play. Unfortunately, my dad doesn't use Steam, so I guess that's why these games aren't selling. It wasn't just anime visual novels that didn't seem to do well, even if they're highly rated. Visual novel, point and click adventure style games just generally don't seem to do so great on Steam. There are a few outliers, but this is also a category I don't really care for, so bye. There's a few other smaller categories in this highly rated yet low revenue zone. Kids games, games that look like shit, or things that are just weird. I think all of these descriptions themselves are plausible reasons for why a game might not sell well on Steam. Okay, so now we've got a somewhat filtered short list of games which are highly rated and don't seem to fit any of these broader underperforming categories. What are we left with? Well, still quite a lot. There were no other obvious trends or anything to go off, so I started going through the games one by one. And then I noticed something. A lot of these games just did not seem great. None of them were bad either, but they didn't scream top 10% of all games to me. They were just fine. I know all this stuff is subjective, but I feel like there was a very clear difference between a lot of these games and games like Superhot or Factorio. I got some outside perspective too, just to make sure I wasn't being too harsh, and they all agreed with my assessments. However, there was one game which I thought was truly great and appeared to be underperforming financially. But first, some honorable mentions. Space Gladiators is a 2D roguelite action platformer, which isn't the most unique game concept I've ever heard, but I feel like Space Gladiators is a pretty solid offering. When I played this, it was quite clearly not as good as games like Dead Cells or Rogue Legacy, but it really didn't feel too far off. The core was pretty solid, but there were a few things that didn't quite feel quite right. The UI was kind of janky. It kind of felt like BS sometimes when I got hit. I think the hitboxes were a bit off or something, and the progression could maybe use a little bit of tweaking. But I think the game really has a lot of potential. I know that last 10% of polish takes a disproportionate amount of effort, but I'd be really interested to see what would happen if this game was pushed just a little bit further. Boomerang X is a fast paced first person shooter where your weapon is this gnarly boomerang. You have crazy movement where you can throw your boomerang and then launch yourself towards it, then do some slow motion charged up shots and feel like a real badass where you're flying through the air doing crazy trick shots. The experience kind of felt similar to Super Hot. It did have its issues though. Similar to Space Gladiators, I felt like it was missing a bit of polish. Some of the controls were a bit weird 
I didn't always find it was clear which parts in the environment would hurt me. Sometimes I clipped out of the arena, but still, a solid game. One thing which I think may be hurting the sales of this game is its demo. When I was first looking into this game, I figured I'd just play the demo to see what it's like. Boomerang X has quite a few different mechanics, and it takes a while to get your head around each of them individually and get used to the controls. However, in the demo, everything is unlocked straight away, and when I played it, I was just overwhelmed and had no idea what was going on. I almost just dismissed the game straight away. If I hadn't watched some YouTubers playing the full game and having a good time, I don't think I would have even bothered trying it. Okay, last honorable mention. Elekhead is a 2D puzzle platformer where the player activates objects in the world by providing power to everything that the character touches, and that power is transferred to everything connected to that. There's some really interesting interactions in the game, and it kept me entertained for a couple hours. It is a pretty short game though, and it does seem to be trying very hard to not use text anywhere, and instead rely on using icons and symbols, even on the Steam page. This did backfire for me though, as when I went to quit the game, I accidentally deleted my save data instead. Looking back at the recording, you could say that this was my fault, but I feel like this wouldn't have happened if it were more clearly explained. All of these games are genuinely good, and I hope I didn't come off as too critical or anything. They're all way better than anything I've ever made. But all I can really speak of is my experience as a player, and that didn't quite reach the level of the great games that I've played. But they were still pretty close, which is a tremendous accomplishment. So what was that great game which seems to be underperforming? Limelight. Limelight is a minimalist puzzle game. I won't give a full sales pitch, but it's a really well-made game, has interesting mechanics with lots of interactions between those mechanics, it has a nice difficulty progression, and is surprisingly heartfelt for a game where the only characters are glowing lines. It has an estimated revenue on Steam of around 95,000, uh, which is still a good amount of pocket change, but low relative to the game's quality. Limelight does seem to have done pretty well on other platforms. It has a huge number of reviews on the Android Play Store, and I get the feeling it did alright on PS4 too, based on YouTube Let's Play coverage. The developer revealed that the game made a total of 100k in its first two years across all platforms. But still, I'd like to know why it didn't do as well as you might expect on Steam. My first theory for why it might not be selling well on Steam was that the visual style might be off-putting to that player base. I think a lot of players on Steam would see a game like this and assume it's too casual for their liking or some mobile game, not for those hardcore gamers. So I decided to split out all other games with tags like casual, minimalist, relaxing, and they did indeed seem to perform quite poorly on Steam. There were a couple of outliers though, Mini Metro and Mini Motorways. Both Mini Metro and Motorways were released by the same developer, with Mini Metro being released first. So Mini Motorways' success would probably be leveraging a lot of the recognition from Mini Metro. So Mini Metro seemed like it would be a more pure point of comparison with Limelight. So what is Mini Metro? It's a minimalist, puzzly strategy game. You have randomly generated landmarks which you need to connect with subway lines. It starts out simple and gets gradually more and more complex as more landmarks of different types are introduced to the game. It's a well polished game which is both a good challenge but can also provide a chilled out and relaxing experience if you want. It has an estimated revenue on Steam of around 1.3 million, an order of magnitude more than Limelight. Mini Metro isn't in the exact same category as Lion Light, but it's in the same general space, and Mini Metro's visual style is messing with my theory for why Lion Light didn't sell as well as other great games. It isn't obvious to me why Mini Metro sold so much better than Lion Light. It would be pretty easy for me to just shrug and say marketing or luck, 
but I'm not satisfied with that. Even if that is true, I want to know the specifics. What properties would I need to know to predict whether a game would earn as much as Mini Metro or as much as Limelight? My investigation begins. Looking at the time played for people who have left reviews, Limelight has a median playtime of around 4 hours and Mini Metro clocks in at around 8 hours. Both games cost the same at $9.99. As far as I can tell, neither developer had a huge fan base prior to releasing their game. Limelight was developed by a solo developer, whereas Mini Metro was developed by a very small team. I enjoyed Limelight more than Mini Metro, and Metacritic seemed to agree with me, which made me even more interested in finding an explanation for the difference in sales. Let's take a look at each game's marketing. Here's my best assessment of what happened in each case. Let's start with Limelight. In an interview at PAX East in 2016, the solo developer did mention bringing on a marketing director for the game prior to its release. Based on the in-game credits, I assume this is referring to Novi Unlimited. It looks like this marketing was mostly around journalists and various trade shows. There didn't seem to be much coverage by large YouTubers and the Twitch viewer numbers looked low, so I'm guessing there were no sponsored streams either. What about Mini Metro? Well, they did their rounds at the trade shows too. It's a fairly similar list to Limelight, but slightly upgraded. They had a PAX Mega Booth compared with Limelight's Mini Booth, which would have brought some more exposure. I'd have to give a slight edge to Mini Metro, but we're not talking an order of magnitude difference here. And if we look at the historical player counts on SteamDB, Mini Metro had more players when it first went into early access than Limelight has ever had. So there's something else going on here. I found a Mini Metro postmortem on GameDeveloper.com, which is apparently the new name for Gamma Sutra, uh, which gave some insights that I think explains what's going on here. The first major factor is that Mini Metro was initially extremely accessible. The early versions of the game were available for free and were playable on their website. From the article. The first release of Mini Metro's playable alpha was in September 2013. We designed the website around the web player. It was front and center on the index page, not hidden away behind a button. The game was quick to play, relatively intuitive, and had a virality that the accessibility of the build played into. Hey, check out the site, you can make your own subway map. The second is that it is a relatable concept. We've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years trying to figure out exactly what it is about Mini Metro that resonates with its players and enabled it to be a success. One thing we come back to is the relatableness of the concept. If someone has had experience with a public transit map, then they'll likely understand what Mini Metro is from a screenshot. The game sells its concept well. Inadvertently, we made a game that communicates the idea of itself very well. It sells itself not just to traditional demographics, but because it relates to an everyday concept, normal people got sold on it too. The last factor is that in Mini Metro, the player is creating something. There's a sense of ownership there. If you watch almost any talk by Will Wright, the creator of games such as The Sims and SimCity, he'll mention how much people like sharing things that they've created in these games. I feel like this would apply to Mini Metro too. If you created a really efficient and beautiful subway network, you'll be somewhat inclined to share that. On the other hand, with a puzzle game like Limelight, sharing how you solved a puzzle kind of ruins it for everyone else. I think these three factors combine into something fairly powerful. The game's understandability and player's sense of ownership, combined with how accessible it was, could lead to a massive amount of organic marketing which would probably generate exposure for the game equivalent to an enormous marketing budget. Okay, here's my plausible explanation for why Mini Metro appears to have sold so much better than Limelight. Games which appear to be very casual and minimal do not do very well on Steam. But, if such a game is great and well marketed, organic viral marketing in the case of Mini Metro, then it can still overcome this hurdle. I know this isn't some earth-shattering concept, who would have guessed that marketing matters? But putting some specific games behind it and looking at how wildly different the numbers are, this made me appreciate this idea a lot more. For me, it's undeniable now. 
for my own games, I'm definitely going to put more thought and care into this than I would have if I hadn't done this investigation. Overall, great games do generally seem to do well. You have no idea how many games I looked through, pre-filtered, just the highly rated ones, and I only managed to find one great game that didn't seem to be getting the recognition it deserved. There are almost certainly more games in this situation, but they seem to be very rare. This is still pretty reassuring, even if making a great game is no guarantee of commercial success, it at least seems like the odds are very good. There are definitely a lot more things I could have looked into, but I need to get back to making my own game and try to make something great of my own. Ciao!